It's a mark of intelligence to consider the possibility that you're wrong and to be capable of understanding the perspectives of others, even perspectives with which you strongly disagree, because even if you aren't wrong, that ability ensures that you're always challenging your own views, sharpening them through battle with others and bringing them as close to the truth as they can possibly be. By the same process, it's a mark of morality to consider the possibility that you're the bad guy. To be constantly assessing your own role and behavior in your interactions and conflicts with others and how you handle them, because even if you aren't the bad guy, that introspection and self-criticism will ensure that you stay on the path of the good guy as closely as you possibly can. That's why the best good guys are often very humble, because they're constantly assessing their own faults. And that's why the worst bad guys are completely convinced that they aren't. They're completely convinced that they're actually the good guys. In fact, they often advertise it overtly because they're incapable of considering any reality otherwise. And so you end up with exactly what we've watched for two years now, a lot of self-proclaimed good guys doing a lot of bad guy things, deceiving, threatening, coercing, or just generally bullying their will onto others because they believe these wrongs are justified if they're done in pursuit of their righteous ends. As though every villain in history didn't believe that the same moral flexibility in pursuit of their ends was also a good guy thing to do. Nobody ever thinks that he's the bad guy until he stops to consider that possibility. Well, how did it get to the point of stacking that many bodies, we often ask in historical retrospect. It got to that point because the bad guys convinced themselves that they were actually good, and so they wrote themselves blank moral checks to do whatever they want in pursuit of their ends. It's the same thinking that produces headlines like this doozy out of the LA Times op-ed pages this week. Mocking anti-vaxxers COVID deaths is ghoulish, yes, but may be necessary. Ghoulish, but necessary. That sounds like a great DNC campaign motto for the midterms. Or, again, the philosophy of every bad guy of the past. Sure, what I'm doing is maybe just a little bit wrong, but it's in pursuit of the right ends. So we'll just abuse our way to utopia. If you just ghoul correctly, Eventually, you sprout angels' wings. This article is by Times business columnist Michael Hiltzig, the author of several other impressive pieces of wrongness and hypocrisy. Last spring, he wrote that the evidence is clear. Lockdowns saved lives without harming economies. If you're curious about that supposedly clear evidence, I talked about that one previously, video linked in the description. And of course, the same guy now advocating responsibly contextualized and restrained mockery and laughter at unvaccinated deaths, himself has urged vaccine caution under the prior administration. But that was when the bad guys were in power. Now that the good boys are back in town, it's not only time to impose our vaccine will on others, it's time to mock them if they don't submit and dance on their graves in gleeful celebration of their deaths. This column centers on the death of Kelly Earnby, an Orange County Republican and deputy district attorney who advocated against vaccine mandates and died of COVID around New Year's Day, unvaccinated. But even that base level description is misleading, or at least insufficiently specific. The title calls her anti-vax, while the column body acknowledges her opposition was to vaccine mandates. The supposedly damning quote against her saying, mandates don't work. Another quote provided being a defense of freedom, which presumably would include, yes, vaccination decisions different from what Kelly Earnby would choose for herself. Turns out, mocking her for her political position is a lot easier when you misrepresent her political position, and so too is mocking her death when you misrepresent her death. Because that's the idea here. Oh, she was anti-vax, and that idiot died of what the vaccine would have prevented. So let's all point and laugh. But a closer look at the circumstances of her death shows more complexity there, too. The column just says she, quote, died of COVID, which makes you think she's hacking up a Rona lung on her deathbed, but that isn't what happened. She was gardening at home and died suddenly from a blood clot. She was never in the hospital suffering from COVID. In fact, there's no indication she suffered any symptoms at all. This sounds a lot like a death that would have otherwise happened anyway, and she simply tested positive for corona incidentally. But even those specific facts aside, this article is more fundamentally about broader moral concepts, and on those two, it is also horrifically wrong. In fact, 
It's a perfect representation of everything wrong with a growing ends justify the means mentality, a belief that moral recklessness today somehow leads to moral purity tomorrow. If you listen carefully, you'll hear variations of this column's basic logic all the time. Here's a fundamental moral reality that we all recognize as true and necessary, but followed by some supposed justification for abandoning that fundamental moral truth. In this case, it's sure the hallmark of civilized thought is a recognition that all life has value, but if some lives live differently, perhaps the value is just a little lower. Sure, the value and purpose of human life is the foundation for our entire moral framework, but maybe if we abandon that just a little bit, we'll somehow get to a society that values life better. We're going to dance on graves to build a culture that values life. That's the thinking here. You wonder how all of history's greatest atrocities were committed? It's that exact philosophy. Human life has value, but you get those atrocities when you treat the value of life not as inherent, but as conditional or selectively exclusive or trivial. If the life we're abusing has no value or less value, well, then it's not really abuse, is it? If the value of life has to be earned rather than something that's pre-existing, well, then those who don't earn it are disposable. Life has value, but is a philosophy with zero limitation. It'll justify the supposed innocence of simple deathbed ridicule, as is the case here, but it just as easily justifies train rides and mass graves. Secondly, this article is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of freedom. The whole premise here is har, 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 you advocated for freedom, and that freedom cost you your life, as though that's some sort of malfunction or failure. You'll hear this thinking all the time. Well, what freedom do you mean? The freedom to die? Yes, I do mean the freedom to die, as in I accept the consequences of my choices, even if they do lead to my death, and I don't trust you to control my life to supposedly prevent it. There are fates worse than death, among them slavery. That's what liberty or death means. And in what other context do we think this way? If a mountain climber dies pursuing his dream of summiting Everest, do we laugh at him for his supposed misuse of his freedoms? Do we ban anyone from ever attempting it again? Or do we recognize that is the life that he chose? And if he could do it again, he probably would because he knowingly accepted his potential death as a risk inherent to his choices. And maybe you say, ah, oh, well, that's different. That was something admirable that killed him. Fine, take any vice that you want. The alcoholic whose liver quits, or the smoker who plugs up his lungs. Do we laugh at their graves for their refusal to go to the AA meetings or to try Nicorette? Or do we give those lives the proper respect of their own choices? even if those choices were unwise. But lastly, this column is a perfect representation of a recurring, very broken philosophy. If it works, do it. Ghoulish but necessary is another way of saying exactly that. Sure, it's morally wrong, but it works. Sure, it's evil, but it produces the effect that we want. And that's what really matters. Again, an approach without any constraint. What's the limitation on ghoulish but necessary? We can reduce the murder rate by putting everybody in prison. We can reduce traffic deaths by demolishing every road in the country. We can slow the spread by executing anybody who tests positive. And maybe you say, yeah, well, come on. Those are extreme examples that are obviously wrong. Well, why are they obviously wrong? Is it because there are moral considerations that are more important than just practical ones, more important than just whether the policy works or not? Yeah, that's the point. That's why judging a policy solely on whether it works is wrong. It justifies any level of immorality or abuse. But worse still, at least in this case, but many others like it too, it doesn't actually work. That's the author's justification for the ghoulishness. Mocking the deaths of the unvaccinated is public education. There may be no other way to make sure that the lessons of these teachable moments are heard. But what evidence is there of the necessary ghoulish mockery working? 
Who exactly have these tactics persuaded? The author's original tweet promoting this article is ratioed by a factor of 24 replies to every like. And no, this isn't simply a comment war between vaxxed and unvaxxed keyboard armies. It's a lot of criticism from vaccinated people who recognize the importance of the moral concepts at stake here. And yeah, that's anecdotal, and yeah, we probably wouldn't expect anybody who actually was persuaded by this article to announce it publicly in the replies, but in the absence of conclusive data, use your own experience and extrapolate. Think about a time where you've been persuaded to change your mind and change your behavior, and actually stuck to it over time, not just bent your own rules in the moment to achieve an end, but genuinely changed your mind for the long term. How did that happen? Was it because someone mocked you? Was it because someone threatened you? Was it because of any of the coercive methods now becoming the norm? Or was it because of someone who assumed your good intentions? Was it because of someone who respected your right to decide for yourself, but someone who brought information and reasoning that was far too convincing for you to believe anything otherwise. That latter approach is the reason I'm talking into this microphone right now. Not because anybody ridiculed me into it, not because anybody threatened me into it, but because the arguments that they brought were so compelling that I just couldn't beat them. And so I had to join them by my own free choice, not at anybody's gunpoint, metaphorical or literal. In other words, ghoulishness was in no way necessary and never is. And if you're defending ghoulishness, because like anything else, it's okay when a good guy does it, you'll have to answer the question, at what point does your ghoulishness actually make you a ghoul? How much bad action can a good guy take before he becomes a bad guy? Because if you take that time to consider exactly how much ghoul cred your good guy hero status has earned you, you might just realize you aren't one. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Gab that is at M L Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Luke King forward to it. Goodbye.